I think all too often, especially in the world of uh, science, science fiction, foresight, there's kind of a dismissal of those kinds of um, soft narratives. Yeah, they're not scientifically accurate, we can ignore it. Um, but I think we ignore them at our peril because those are the stories that, that we viscerally, we as a human society viscerally respond to. We are driven by emotion, we're driven by empathy. And intelligence is a way of, our intelligence is a way of contextualizing why we feel things. You know, what our relationship is to things that we have an emotional relation, an emotional connection with. Allowing us to continue to have, you know, the intelligence lets us continue to have and maintain and, you know, the persistent emotional connections. You know, as I've gotten older, I've really come to recognize the power of empathy and the, how critical emotional connection is to building a viable future. We are, as futurists, all too often fascinated by tools, fascinated by gadgets and technology, because they're understandable, they're quantifiable, um, they're profitable. And we don't pay enough attention to the feelings that surround us. You know, the, you know, the, whether we're talking politics or, or um, gender relations or you know, all the different kinds of things that are much squishier, much more political, much harder to forecast. It's, they're harder to forecast because we shy away from them. We forget that these are the things that drive the, most of our behavior. A desire to be liked, a desire to be wanted, a desire to be heard, a desire to connect. I'm sitting here in front of you, in front of these cameras, not simply because I think this would be an interesting conversation to have, and, and by extension, an interesting narrative to construct to be, to be heard by other people. It's because I want to make a connection, because I want to be heard. And that has driven so much of our development as, you know, as a human civilization. The desire, desire. And I would really like to encourage people who are in this field of speculative thinkers to be speculative feelers as well, to, be, to come up with a really crude phrase off the top of my head, um, to, to be willing to take a risk of, of empathizing. The empathy is risky because when you feel for someone, feel for something, it hurts when that someone or something hurts. I think one of the, the best results of human civilization, one of the best consequences of humanization, human civilization has been the expansion of our circle of empathy. And you look back 100, 200 years at the descriptions of how people responded to dogs and cats. They were essentially were garbage. Yeah, you, may have had a pet, you may have had a pet dog, may have had a pet cat, but there was no sense of them as being moral agents or being something that you would empathize with. That was, that was a rare thing. And that was a rare thing around other people in an era of slavery. A rare thing around other people in an era of you know, lack of rights for women. And as time has gone on, our sense of empathy, our, our willingness to feel what someone else is feeling has expanded. It has expanded to, to include other, you know, other ethnicities, include you know, various other genders, has, has expanded for a lot of people to include animals. And I think that's going to, that's going to get further expanded. And you know, may in time come to be, expand to include autonomous machines that we can empathize with. And that's going to be freaky for a lot of people, but I suspect one of the triggers for that may actually come from the development of sex bots. Because, you know, sex is something that's a primal urge. And if you're having this kind of emotional connection, emotional interaction with another thing, and it has a physical appearance that replicates what we come to expect to be a human, and behaves in a way that feels human-like, sufficiently human-like, we may start to generate, may start to feel a lot of empathy for our machines. We already feel empathy for machines. 
You know, there are cases, of, you know, classic examples of soldiers being upset by the description of a bomb-sniffing robot. You know, not even a robot, a remote control device. And as our things become more behavioral, you know, they respond to us, we respond to them with behaviors and not, and not simply checklists. Our empathy for those things will grow as well. And that's why, and that's what, you know, yet another reason why I think it's critical for speculative thinkers, futurists and science fiction writers alike, in fact, anyone who's concerned about the future, to pay attention to empathy. Empathy is the critical, the critical element of our future. It's the critical element of our present. And it doesn't get enough attention. Once we have functional, intelligent, self-aware machines, I suspect that the first first generations, first, numerous generations, will be categorically insane because we will have imparted a limited set of the elements of awareness and. You know, by plugging in, oh, let's try these different senses of emotion, or these different qualities. Let's plug in this awareness, awareness of self, of physical self, you know, proprioception or something like that. Those, the disconnection between those different elements, the modularity, you know, at least to me, it seems likely will be um, extremely disruptive to a coherent cognitive flow. So we need to be aware of that, that you know, the first AI that we deal with, the, the first true artificial intelligence we come up with, is likely going to be insane. And maybe we, have some, maybe we should have some sympathy for that. Um, you know, when you think about the idea, I know that folks like Ben Gertzel have talked about you know, creating your AI entirely in software and, and giving, them, giving them virtual embodiment. And that's kind of cool and interesting. But is that actually sufficient? Because we, you know, I think it's become very clear as we learn more about how the brain works and how intelligence and awareness works. It's very much an embodied experience. You can't just be a brain in a pan. And right now we're building a lot of, we're, we're aiming ourselves towards building a lot of artificial brains and pans. And so the idea of trying to construct um, value-laden basically trying to quantify and, out and turn values or make values algorithmic. I, I really like that that's being done. I'm very happy that that's being done. I would caution that it won't work as well as you want it to at first and be willing to learn. Um, it's going to be an exciting next few decades. And it's going to be a terrifying next few decades. And it's going to be a boring next few decades. Because all the things that excite us and terrify us very quickly become part of our everyday world. And they become banal. And we can't let ourselves fall into that trap. We have to remember that we are creating a fantastic mythological future. And we need to be willing to accept that, play with it, and make it better than we could have hoped.